Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar today, Understanding Emotional Well-Being of Asian Youth in College. My name is Melissa Yu. I am a 12th grader from Worthington Kilbourne High School in Columbus, Ohio. I will be your host and moderator for today. This webinar is proudly, proudly presented by the joint efforts of Project Lotus, based in Oregon, and our partner Let's Talk, a virtual conference series. We are all really excited for this webinar and to help contribute to the effort of destigmatizing the topic of mental health in the Asian American community. Thank you all so much for attending today. So as the daughter of immigrants and a first generation Asian American, I have firsthandedly felt the cultural stigma of mental health in the Asian community. And I'm sure that many of you have either seen or experienced the same effects of mental health stigma as I did. I know for me personally, I faced a lot of difficulties navigating resources about mental health and getting the support I needed because of lack of understanding about what mental health was and why it is important to talk about mental health in the Asian American community. Additionally, I experienced many intergenerational conflicts stemming from misunderstandings, communication, and cultural differences. This is why I was compelled to join Project Lotus to promote necessarily necessary dialogues about mental health awareness in our community. Project Lotus is a nonprofit based on based in Portland, Oregon, dedicated to addressing the mental health and well-being of the Asian American community through education, empowerment, and offers offering resources like resources and programs like this one. Um, just like how the lotus is often a symbol of growth and beauty, even in murky waters, we as an organization want to help our community blossom through mental health awareness. Project Lotus consists of a team of volunteers across the country, including students, parents, professionals, and community leaders. If you are interested in seeing the stories and community blogs of fellow Asian American, youth or access resources and education that actually understand Asian culture or programs like this one designed for all members of the community, please visit our website and social media. On the screen, we also have a WeChat group that you can scan the QR code um, that is currently on the screen. And it is a great way to contribute to the community and be around other Asians who support our community's mental well-being or just to have general discussions about mental health. We are all in this together, no matter if you are a struggling parent or a stressed youth. And we really truly hope that our resources can help support you. We want to give a special thank you to Let's Talk, who we've collaborated with through our shared missions and passion for mental health in our community. Today's webinar specifically is talking about the transition from high school to college and mental health within college. The transition from high school to college is never easy and especially during this year's hectic events. Today, it is my honor to introduce you to our speaker that will be talking about what she has seen in her experience as a professional regarding the topic of transitioning to college and mental health and well being during college. She will also be giving strategies and resources to keep in mind throughout college for both students and parents. We will be also hosting a amazing panel of college students from a collection of various different universities. I would like to invite the audience to give your best focus to our presenters to mute your phone and grant the presenters your full attention. Please kindly hold on to your questions until the end where we will be having a Q&A session. First, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Bonnie Lau. Dr. Lau has received her master's degree in social work, MDA, and PhD in physics. Since 2004, she has given over 100 talks on parent-child relationships. 
Dr. Lau was an intern social worker at the Clinical and Psychological Services Center at Princeton University and is now a licensed social worker at Rutgers University. We are immensely grateful for her compassion to help her community by speaking with us today. With that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Lau. Hello, uh, everyone. Can I share my screen? Okay, um, let's get started. Uh, thank you, thank you for all coming to join this event. Uh, this just shows how many people are now very interested in this topic about our youth's emotional well being. So, first of all, um, uh, just now, thank you, Melissa, give me that uh, introduction. Um, when she talked about, I have been traveling and talking to parents, and this is mostly what I've been talking to them about, which is uh, EQ parenting. It's based on emotional intelligence. We talk about the relationship and the uh, internal intrinsic motivation and also uh, accepting uh, your children. So from that one, this today, what I'm going to talk about is a relatively newer experience and new topic. This is about the well-being of our youth in college. Uh, and my understand most of the audience today are parents. So I will be mostly um, trying to address this issue from the perspective of speaking to parents. And also I wanted to keep in mind that we have um, uh, youth uh, have our college students or high school students in the audience. So why are we here, right? Why are we here? I remember about 20 some years ago uh, when I first talked to people about uh, mental health issues, people thought I was the one who's crazy because you know what I'm talking about. Uh, talking about mental health issue in our community uh, for the longest time, it has been a very taboo uh, topic, a lot of stigma around it. No one wants to talk about it, as if, if we're talking about it, our children will be some kind of unlucky and may be able to get it. So, but now the general health, mental health conditions are increasingly being uh, recognized worldwide. And as I, uh, I'm showing here on the screen, as I hope everyone will really take a look at it if you have not heard about what the definition is for mental health. So this is why now people are not as afraid to talk about mental health because it's not just about somebody crazy. Uh, it's about a state of well, well-being and it's really talking about how you can actually cope with the normal stresses of our life and how much you can be productive and be able to work uh, to make a contribution. Uh, so this is um, something uh, increasingly being recognized as an important aspect of uh, general health. And according to the World Health Organization, the prevalence of all mental health problems is probably one in four people. That number might have been changed. Uh, and, uh, but basically from my own experience, I've been mostly seeing anxieties, depression, uh, different kinds of behavior disorders and um, substance use. Uh, and this is why the World Health organization uh, started initiative in 2019. Uh, just that you know, this is not just uh, the Project Lotus interest in this, it's a worldwide issue. So 
why should we care? Um, especially in today's teens, the anxiety and depressions are steadily arising. In particular, in our Asian family, um, it has been reported uh, there are higher rates, uh, there, there is a high rate of depression and social anxiety and higher rates of suicide thoughts and suicide attempts. And we don't really have statistics on actual completed suicide among college students, but just based on um, individual certain colleges incomplete kind of evidence, there um, and you talk to professionals, they will have that impression or anecdotal uh, experience of higher rates of completed suicides among uh, college students. This is we're talking about Asian families, so this is a very sad, very serious situation, and some even address it as a crisis in our community. And it's also uh, we're also. Uh, the, the, the race that's least likely for our children to receive treatment and also related to what we're talking about, uh, the stigma culturally associated with any kind of mental health issues. So briefly, uh, what are signs of mental health problems? And just for the parents, I mean, you might have heard about some of these, uh, but I have, uh, I, I would like to, uh, okay. Uh, these are uh, maybe some of the, uh, this is some of these, uh, if you read through the list, some of you may realize that, uh, oh, that's why we thought mental health problems on the first look are those maybe a little like a, crazy people look at this you know excessive paranoia and uh, just the uh, long lasting sadness I mean, it's not likely to be my children you know so uh, but in reality what we have seen is uh, just uh, th this is very common uh, now we have seen more and more kids say experiencing like tearfulness crying and the negative self-critical statements, thinking like, uh, I'm no good, yeah, and just, I'm useless. What's the point of living? Uh, okay, and also like low energy, low motivation, in irritability, anger, you know, talk about the extreme changes in mood. Sometimes we just thought, well, my kids are, are really have a bad temper, but some of these could be signs of mental health problems. And, uh, some kids have suicidal thoughts of uh, talking about killing themselves and actually harming themselves, you know, cutting um, and substance use, sad, low mood, irresponsibilities, not finishing homework. And some of these kids, you may see them as playing computer game for excessive amount of time. And some sometimes parents thought, oh, because you, spend all this time playing computer games. So that's why your grades is going down. Uh, for some kids, it's just a, um, they're playing computer game to mask their mental issues. Some of these could be learning disabilities. Some of these could be excessive anxieties, but they are using computer games as a uh, cover up. So, so as parents, you know, if you're just focusing on uh, stop playing computer games, you're not being very helpful. So let's all realize and some of these could be signs of mental health issues. And also like social withdrawal, isolation, you know, not coming out of the bedroom and problems with sleep and appetite. You know, in my uh, practice, I have seen a lot of kids not being able to sleep well uh, I actually, I have to admit, it was uh, surprising to me. So many young people cannot sleep well. And also, you talk about uh, tr uh, trouble thinking, cannot uh, concentrate, uh, difficult smiling, um, can't really laugh, having fun. And 
So I'm just naming some of these things that commonly we have seen, uh, and but not to try to scare everyone. Most in, most importantly, some uh, the, is the last line. What we have heard or have seen, some of the kids they look uh, some of those very um, uh, upbeat, when uh, young guang hai zi of it, very. Uh, responsible, uh, you really think, you wish your own children are like them, you know, those kind of kids. They don't have any of these obvious symptoms on the, on, on the, on the outside, but what has been referred to as a duck syndrome, you know, it's just like duck in the pond, they look very calm on the top, but actually uh, underneath the water, they were really very busy paddling, you know, lots of anxieties and lots of uh, unspoken emotions. So these uh, these are the stressors uh, for our Asian families. Uh, again, this may not be covering everything, but if you just uh, look through the the list, uh, some of these probably very familiar to all of us. The pressure to live up to a model minority stereotypes. I talked to one of the uh, one of my clients came back at the beginning of the school year, and usually uh, as Princeton, what they do is, even though you have been seeing a counselor on your on your own off campus, but at the beginning of every year, you do come back to the schools counseling and psychological service center just to get a reevaluation. So, I. I was talking to some of these uh, students and sometimes they feel like the therapist may not really been able to connect with them because, you know, we don't have childhood poverty, we don't have family uh, negligence, uh, uh, the parents, you know, really love us. And, and so, some children, some, some college kids, they, as they are describing their family upbringing, it's very hard to put a finger on why you have these anxieties according to the current textbooks. So that's an important thing to be aware of. What we learn in school, what I learned in school, a uh, lot of the, what we call the uh, modalities, the model like why we have these symptoms, they are not necessarily applicable to the Asian families, you know, because we are minority and not have been too many studies on us. So for instance, one, many, actually many, many uh, young people come to me will kind of feeling the uh, uh, counselors or therapists may not be able to really connect with them because they're always trying to find out what's wrong in your childhood upbringing. Uh, uh, whether there have been family abuse, you know, whether uh, parents are fighting, these things. So, I, one time I was talking to uh, one of my clients, I said, would you say that in our culture, sometimes these pressure from the parents may be invisible. For instance, if you just go to a supermarket and come back into the car, your mom simply just need to say, oh, uh, just, the, the auntie we just met is graduated from Harvard. And she did not even have to say it. So you have to go to Harvard. I mean, just by saying that, and this, this student sitting in front of me, just nodding her head, just, yeah, 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 that's exactly how I feel. So for them, it's sometimes very hard to describe to a therapist. It is this kind of pressure they experience uh, growing up. Um, what makes it worse is they have already internalized this kind of pressure. Uh, they have been conditioned by the parents that this is a good thing. Good thing that you always wanted to be better. Um, you wanted to be trying the, 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 to be the best you can be. All these sounds like a very proper and right. But what we have found out again and again is what kind of price these young people are paying. So there is a balance. We're not saying, um, oh, so we'll go back home telling our kids, you don't have to study. You don't have to get good grades. So it is 
the bottom line is that is, is the, the reality, you know, how we can actually communicate with our children to talk about the reality, what is the, the actual intrinsic reality, what is the reality we construct for them that is almost sometimes impossible for them to achieve. But coming back to this list, you know, pressure, where does pa- uh, pressure come coming from? A lot of these are from the parents, their own insecurity, their own anxieties kind of projecting onto their children. So uh, we talk about the mental health stigma and we also talking about, uh, talk, uh, talk about the uh, racism recently, you know, with a lot of people I've been talking about, especially our children experience in school. Uh, and so, uh, anti-Asian sentiment, sometimes easier for, for grown-ups, for parents to say, I didn't experience anything. Uh, and that kind of attitude, sometimes kind of dismissive of what our children may not be willing to share with us. And it can be extremely painful because for us grown-ups to come to this country, we already have pretty established uh, inner self, like. Uh, we kind of know who we are, uh, our basic value system already established before we came over here, um, especially if we came here for, for, for graduate school, right? Most of us did. And so for us to be able to feel really hurt or painful from any kind of racism or anti-Asian sentiment, it's not that easy. Uh, sometimes we have pretty tough skin, you know, uh, we are, so for our children, it's different, you know, uh, because they were born here, they, in reality, they didn't choose to come here. So um, this for some of the uh, young people, uh, especially for pre-college students, could be a big stressor, it's depending on the kind of school environment they, they are growing up. Uh, uh, bicultural stress, right? Uh, certain things are, certain values are not quite in alignment, you know, the Western and the Eastern. So our children have to kind of figure out between the two. Um, certain things for us, for the parents, it's like obvious, you know, uh, this is the right thing for you. But actually for them, it's kind uh, it's very harmful, very hurtful. Um, so there's this difficulty about talking to parents. I want to say uh, our children actually, especially when experiencing difficulty, they are they actually wanted to talk to parents. So uh, sometimes sometimes our parents had this impression: my children never want to talk to me. It is true uh, that depending on how your previous conversation or relationship has been with the children. You know, on the very first screen, I put up that three elements for EQ parenting. The number one is relationship. So having a very good, very kind of chill, (laughs) cool uh, experience, uh, the relationship with your children. Uh, So it's very important. If anything they say, they tell you, and you have this big reaction, so it's very unlikely for them to tell you more about, it's very, it will be difficult for them to tell you more about uh, what they are actually going through. Uh, Actually, I should say, even if you have tried everything, you have been a very good listener, and it, Chances are it may still happen that your children would not be willing to tell you everything. And when that happened, you know, we, we parents, we need to give ourselves some compassion. Uh, it's not your fault. It's not always our fault. So, so get that thought out of your mind that if I have a perfect relationship with my children, my children is going to tell me everything. I give you an example, like my own, uh, my own children, uh, my own daughter, when she, uh, uh, had certain, when she realized, when she uh, went into this private school and she realized everyone was wearing very 
expensive name brand. And our family is probably, I mean, she probably just wear old navies or <laughs> caps, you know, and, and she even think she, she's pretty uh, fashionable, you know, as, as long as picking up stuff for uh, according to her own taste. Uh, but when she realized that, she actually, um, I mean, my, I have to say my daughter has spent a, a couple of years in China. So, so she's very, fairly uh, solid, grounded on the Eastern value, I would say the Asian value. <laughs> I mean, she, I, don't, I didn't necessarily teach her, so you have to be thrifty and all that. But it's just like, uh, she chose not to tell me. And she actually suffered during that first first year, as I later realized, because she said, "Mom, I knew at that time if I told you, um, my friends were all wearing this kind of clothes. I felt kind of different. I know you would buy these for me, like three hundred dollars, like a rain boots, you know, like the the Burberry rain coat, you know." Um, like hundreds of dollars uh, a piece. I knew you would buy it and my fa our family could afford it, but that's not my value. I don't think we should spend that much money on these things. So you see, so on one hand, she was suffering, you know, certain things, certain situations she would not feel she would fit in. You know, she might not get invited to all the parties and all that. But at the same time, she's holding this, um, this belief, this, 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 we talk about growing up in this bicultural environment. So this added stress, right? So she, 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 she's so determined. Actually, it's a uh, first time she told me, she, uh, she's very happy. She spent like $50 at uh, Forever 2021 20, was that she, she said, mom, I actually bought like a seven pieces. And, but above all, I earned those Fifty dollars. Uh, she was working at the bakery, so so it's that kind of mentality or cultural upbringing. Uh, for some children, it could provide extra stress. You know, um, yeah. My, when my daughter thought that she was so proud, she she spent that fifty dollar of her own buying these. That was already uh, after first a couple years in college, I think. So she was already like. Uh, much more sure of herself. So you could imagine in the first year in high school, she was uh, experiencing some of these uh, very hurtful. Uh, it, it, she was in this, uh, she was having these hurtful experience, but she chose not to tell me. So just to let you know, these possibility of what our children are going through are, are, are real, are very real, not just uh, happen to other people's children, okay? But I think important thing is always tell our children we love them. So even at their lowest point, they at least uh, can, they, they, can, uh, they can feel your love. Uh, sometimes our, uh, we as parents, we, we are running the risk of we, we, we're, we're telling them what to do too much. We thought that's our way of showing our love. But I often ask our teenagers, do you feel the, your parents' love? And sometimes they will say, I guess so, uh, because they will think what all these things that parents made them do, maybe it's because they love them. But to be honest, they don't actually feel it. Uh, so because our we, it's, it's, I mean, that could, I could go on on that subject for another couple of hours, if you can see. I, I have some um, YouTube uh, recordings uh, you could uh, look for. You can search by my name, EQ, uh, EQ, uh, EQ Parenting, EQ Liao, L-I-A-O. And uh, I would uh, encourage all the parents or even if your Chinese is good enough, to just, just look for some of these uh, just to see how you can better understand uh, how our relationship is with our children. So difficult talking with parents, that in itself is a stressor. So in my experience, you know, as a social work intern at the Counseling Psychological Services, oh, by the way, this CPS or some call it uh, 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 
CAP. Uh, so that will be C A P S. Many colleges have such kind of centers, and parents need to really talk to their their kids before they go into college. That you are very in support of them going to seek professional help at their uh, CPS or CAPS at their college. They need your open permission. Uh, that's my experience. Uh, a lot of the Asian students, they are so worried that if they go to these places and God forbid my mom find out, she's going to freak out because they are thinking, number one, you will be very disappointed, okay? And you've been uh, your, your dad's proudest child uh, and uh, your, your mom probably talk about it, in, talk about you in uh, uh, WeChat groups and uh, brag about you. Uh, and so, so you, even though when she brag about you, you hate it. When your dad, you know, um, brag about you, you, you really do, don't like it, but you kind of don't want to make them disappointed. Uh, so a lot of the uh, kids telling us they would not want to come to see us, especially Asian kids, they are so worried about disappointing their parents. And uh, secondly, they are so uh, concerned that their parents may be worried for them. So I actually talked to the director of the Princeton CPS and we agree uh, that's uh, Dr. Calvin Chen, uh, Calvin Chen. And we, um, we agree that uh, as parents, uh, we should be more proactive in telling our children, do go seek help and you do not have to tell me. Okay, um, sometimes when Dr. Chen tell them parents that as young adults, when they come to see us, we will not keep you informed and parents will have uproar and say, what, we would not know when they come to see you? Actually, that's good. If they know every time they come to see the therapist on campus that you will know, they were less likely to come. So please do encourage them to go and let them know uh, the CPS or CAPS would not be informing parents unless they are safety concerns. Okay. Uh, and secondly, do tell them you will not be disappointing. Uh, you will not be disappointed because this is fairly common. Uh, as my experience in Princeton for my limited hours, I have seen 200 students. Okay. About... 20, 20, like 27, 25% of all Princeton students have visited CPS. Okay, so this is fairly common, telling them. And as far as making you concerned or worried, let your children know if you do go seek help, that will make me less worried. Okay, so please do make it clear to them. And we have seen a, a wild range, a wide range of um, conditions. So, especially for freshmen, a lot of uh, clients coming in talking about feeling empty. Um, they were very busy when they were in high school, running the model UN or um, debate team, their schedule fully packed. They have this goal seemingly very clear. They want to get into the college, a <laughs> good college, but actually they feel very empty because a lot of the uh, push and shuffle and the effort were seemingly only aiming at getting into a college, getting into a Ivy League. So once they are there, um, many of the students experiencing uh, the emptiness. Um, why am I here? So, so if, if, 
in the contrast, if, as we talked about earlier, if uh, some of these kids were pretty much on their own, uh, they, they have their passion, they are self-motivated, truly, truly intrinsic uh, motivated, uh, not because they don't want to disappoint you. Uh, you know, there's a difference between they wanted to go, say, to Princeton to study mathematics because they truly love mathematics as opposed to, oh, I have to go to Princeton so that my mom and dad will be really proud of me. They go through a lot. They sacrifice a lot. I don't want to disappoint them. So sometimes we see kids uh, are all seem to be motivated. I mean, I'm not talking about the kids who are not motivated. Kids are not motivated. Sometimes you have a lesser concern uh, uh, in terms of mental health. So there could be a difference, right? Maybe they have learning disability, but if not, actually, those are maybe the kids uh, have um, greater potential in the future too. Uh, so you don't have to really worry about it. Now, uh, the, but I'm talking about the kids who are really pushing themselves. There's a difference between internal motivation versus intrinsic motivation. Internal motivation could be a double-edged sword because they are doing things mostly for, um, for because of the outside factors, because of you, uh, the parents, uh, or because they wanted to earn a lot of money uh, and, or, or get good grades. Any of these factors, they may not have fully control they may not have full control. So, so these are the dangerous kind of internal motivation. What, uh, so we have seen some of the kids uh, ended up in uh, colleges or good colleges wondering why I'm here. So, um, but uh, talking to therapists uh, do help. Um, anxieties, very wide range of anxieties. Academics, some of these kids never even got an A minus in their lives, you know, and uh, and I, I see these kids as if they are just uh, like in the dark, uh, walking on uh, on a trail and be told that just follow the trail, you'll be able, you'll be fine, you know, uh, but don't step off the trail because it could be dangerous, you know, uh, so so just follow whatever the checklist uh, parents prescribe to you, you'll be fine. So when they be the uh, valedictorian of their school, they're all feeling great, doing well. But once they're in college, sometimes they see, oh my gosh, the whole, maybe all, all my friends are <laughs> valedictorian. And, uh, and so if uh, they got A minus, oh my gosh, uh, the sky's falling off. Uh, you know, so, they do not know how to handle the mistakes or failings or imperfections. Uh, I heard some of the uh, young people uh, actually talking about um, sometimes looking at the other students in the class, my classmates, I cannot be just pretty, I have to be the prettiest. I cannot be just the smart, I must be the smartest. You know, so all of these, uh, we don't have time to go into why they feel this way, uh, but basically these are um, making them excessively anxious, uh, so uh, afraid of uh, stepping off the normal path. Uh, normal path, I mean, I think A, nothing but A, oh, maybe A plus, okay. So all these things that we overstressed when our children growing up, um, they are paying a price. Some of them paying a huge price. They could not believe now that you're telling them, it's okay, you're already in Princeton. If you don't get A's, it's okay. They could not believe you, you know, so the uh, huge problem. Uh, and especially, I should make a special mark about the LGBTQ community, uh, Asian, uh, well, God forbid you are Asian and your LGBT community. Oh, who are you going to talk to? You know, your parents will freak out, you know, especially if you're transgender, oh my gosh, that's even worse. So all these things, if we parents could open ourselves loving them, listen to them, and learn during the process, learning about what is this LGBTQ community. I have parents coming to, to me, have no idea what LGBTQ stands for, you know, so, so uh, 
reaching out to, to our children, um, just having conversation, and asking them, what is this? You know, what's going on in colleges? You know, even they themselves looks like a straight, you know, like a normal, whatever, uh, but do talk to them, learn uh, from them so that they feel that you are really a cool parent. You know, you're willing to talk to them about these things. Um, and also uh, some of the uh, students really, uh, during the high school year and then college, they have these, we call it existential ultimate concerns. Uh, some of the, they uh, talk about life meaninglessness uh, and, and we don't have time to go into it, but this is also we sometimes see in gifted individuals they're thinking a lot, uh, what make it worse that they don't think people around them understand. All these other people are worrying about how to get in on Wall Street, how to make more money. And I'm the only one worrying about why, you know, what's the meaning of life, you know? So they feel extremely lonely. And uh, uh, I think, uh, okay, I, I don't have time to go into that, but some of the uh, students who out, uh, essentially committed uh, suicides, uh, they, left the words uh, are from from what they were uh, struggling with, you could see they are kind of in this kind of category. They may not have uh, learning issues, the academic uh, marks, uh, academics are uh, is excellent and uh, they have a lot of friends, but they could not get over with this loneliness of, of thinking about these deep existential issues. Okay, how can we, I think I'm probably taking a little longer than I, I'm supposed to. Uh, the, uh, I would say uh, there are different uh, strategies to cope with these uh, stresses. Mm, I'm not going to get into uh, specifics resources definitely uh, parents no matter how capable you think you are uh, please do keep it in mind professional support uh, it's 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 very could be very helpful mm, and uh, sometimes uh, therapy plus medita uh, med med medication uh, are necessary and all these uh, I, I don't want don't have time to get into the details but uh, I uh, suggest if you go seeking therapist for children or in some time for yourself, uh, you can go to psychologytoday.com. I normally recommend people find three therapists of different kind of background. Some may have PhDs in psychology. Sometimes uh, some people may have social work background. Um, and then try connect with them to see whom you connect with the best and uh, and because not every therapist have the cultural background to understand what you or your children are talking about so uh, do look for a different one not just try one and fail and just give up then oh forget it i don't all these therapists are useless no uh so um actions i would say uh Children need uh, our children need our help need, uh, to uh, to really decrease their stresses. And uh, recently, I've been exposed to conscious parenting. I highly recommend uh, for the parents who uh, look up, uh, you know, look for it and try to see different ways of looking at uh, our children, uh, their reality, and uh, what is the reality we constructed in our own head, our delusion. And we, uh, when we force that kind of delusion on them and hoping they will become the kind of people we wanted them to be, it's huge stress for them. Just uh, not easy to just say, um, don't feel stressful. Uh, it's 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 it will not work, you know. So so we need to go a little deeper on that. So decrease stress. It's easier said than done. Um, for for parents who who are really open 
to work with our children or work with ourselves, I highly recommend learning Dao uh, De Jing. Uh, this is Chinese uh, ancient philosophy work. Uh, more and more Asian uh, therapists or Chinese uh, Chinese uh, background uh, therapists with Chinese background are uh, uh, trying to to use it as one of the ways of balancing out this uh, stress, this this cultural driven. Uh, internalize the stress. Um, some have reported very effective, and we just need to have more research, uh, uh, having more uh, more research result published, so that we can make it a more evident, make it more like an evidence based uh, strategy. Uh, so more therapists will be able to use it to treat our uh, youngsters. You know, definitely healthy habits, sleeping eating, having enough nutrition, not junk food, especially B vitamins, some reported will be helpful in terms of releasing stress. Uh, definitely sleep is a very important thing. Uh, so outdoor activities, this some of these things to talk about. Uh, mindfulness um, and self-compassion. trying to um i guess my my slides messed up a little bit but i wanted to um go back to here um okay sorry about that <laughs> i wanted to talk about the self-compassion uh since i cannot see it myself um very quickly, okay. Self-compassion, let's just put it this way. Be willing to, um, just like when we feel compassion about others, uh, uh, we more understanding their suffering uh, and uh, mm, we should reach to ourselves. Uh, parents or our young people in the audience, we should uh, look into this subject, you know, since today I'm not good, doing a good job about that. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, but the, uh, be able to uh, be able to accept self uh, imperfection and uh, feel, feeling un uh, really caring about ourselves. Um, especially when we make mistakes and when we uh, fail at certain things, instead of criticizing, uh, like a very, uh, uh, very self-critical. You know, sometimes uh, we, we we grow up in an in environment, especially our parents. You know, tend to be more critical of our own children and, and more generous to other people. And our children growing up in that kind of environment, they learn that they should always blame themselves. I mean, taking responsibility and getting control is one thing that actually helpful. That helped in reducing stress. But when you make mistakes, when you are just uh, uh, certain things are really out of your control, and this this is this this are the times that we should really practicing self-compassion and the uh, mindfulness i uh, this is related to uh, meditation this is the most uh, re researched approach to uh, treat or deal with uh, anxiety so uh, there are apps uh, uh, you can download one is um I wrote this, but I cannot show you. One is called Headspace. Okay, just spell it out. Uh, if anyone could type it up in the chat box, I, that would be great. Headspace, and another one is called wa Waking Up. Waking Up. So I would uh, uh, end here and just uh, welcome for any Q and A uh, uh, questions, and I'll answer. Okay, sorry about that. That's <laughs> the slides messed up. So sorry, we are going to be moving the Q&A for Dr. Lau um, to the end of our webinar. Um, so if you have any questions for Dr. Lau, please hold on to them um, until the end of our webinar. So thank you so much, Dr. Lau, for giving your professional insight on mental health in Asian American youth. Um, 
we all really, really appreciate your professional insight. Next, we will be having a panel discussion with students from a diverse collection of universities. We felt that hearing the experiences of students who have experienced the transition to college can be a great point of education for both parents and students um, of what to expect throughout the process. Thank you so much to Patrick Kim, Georgia Tech class of 2023, Mason Liu, VCU class of 2023, Neha Ataru, class of ASU class of 2024, and Elisa Ma, Carnegie Mellon class of 2023. So if the panelists could please turn on their video and mics. Okay, so to start off, please share your story about transitioning to college and your mental health throughout the process. Yeah, so I guess I can start us off first. So in high school, I guess to preface this with high school, I brute forced it. And to, I guess to give a definition of brute force, it like if you're doing a math problem, you're like brute force every single like answer until you find a solution. So high school to me was like brute forcing. I try every single solution to attempt to reach the answer. And the answer being like the definition of success. So success in like high school would be, like part of success would be considered like getting those perfect grades, getting that perfect GPA, those test scores. And like with this new evolution of like college applications, it also became being socially perfect. So I brute force those a lot. And by brute forcing it, I think that like, I thought that was the easy path, you know, like you might as well brute force it like without looking into any other solutions. And I'll talk about the other solutions when I talk about my transition to college. But with this brute forcing, I think that like it took a lot of time and it took a lot of energy and to achieve that state of being like perfect, but perfect is impossible. So why not achieve for nearing perfect? But nearing perfect also takes a lot of runs. But I think something that my parents really helped me was that they told me like, Elisa, it's make sure you don't like compensate uh, happiness for success. Like make sure you reach for happiness rather than success. And at that time I was like, oh yeah, duh. Like, of course, like why would I be sacrificing my happiness for success? But it was almost like this temporary blade or a temporary like band-aid saying like, oh, of course be happy and then like also be successful. But it put even more pressure on me because not only do I have to be like successful, reach those high grades, I have to be happy as well. And I guess with that, like it didn't allow, like I needed this facade of being like, like perfect, you know, like don't show anything on the inside. Don't show anything on the inside. If you're struggling, like it's okay. Like you just have to get through what's happening right now and it'll be fine. Like if you get that um, task done and you should be fine. So I got through high school with brute force. That was my mentality, just brute force. And then like, if you get into a good college then you should be happy, you'll be fine. So after I got into college, I was like beyond the moon. I was like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. Like I got into the college that I wanted to and like I thought I made my parents happy. So like, I exited high school and I took the summer just kind of like relaxed. I'm like, yay, I'm finally stress-free. And I entered Carnegie Mellon thinking like, okay, I know it's going to be hard. Everyone around me is going to be like amazing. I know that. And I know the bar is going to raise. But hey, brute forcing works in high school. Therefore, it must work in college, right? And this brute forcing method, like the, ha the habits I created when it came to brute forcing was not the greatest. I thought that like, failure was terrible because by brute forcing, you'll always lead, it'll always lead you to the solution. But of course you might like encounter some failures, but like major failure is nothing I encountered. Major struggle, I didn't encounter that. And asking for help, not even my book. I did not want to ask for help because brute forcing, it was independent, it was internal to me. So then I went to CMU and my oh my were the classes like so like rigorous and I was like, man, it seems like everyone else is like doing completely fine. Until like I talked to someone like, hey, like how is the first week you see me going? And they're like, yeah, I failed my first homework quiz. And I was like, oh my goodness, I can't believe they just told me that they failed their first homework quiz. 
and they're like, oh yeah, I also love the class. And in my mind, I was like processing, like, how can you love a class, not do well in it, and think it's super difficult? Like that trio did not make sense to me. But it kind of took like this while to think like, okay, a lot of people around me are surrounded by this goal of learning. I, on the other hand, was had this goal like from a child, like, okay, get those good grades, get those test scores. But I never had the desire to learn. But everyone around me had this desire to learn, making them say like, okay, grades, not a problem. That, that's a secondary priority, but you might little, but just learn. So I think that like it took me a while to like like think, okay, what's happening? And I had this like like almost epiphany, you know, like it was week two, I had this problem set and I looked at problem two pro out of seven. I looked at problem two and I literally just broke down. Like I cried. I was like, man, I cannot do problem two. How am I supposed to get through this darn P set? And it's only week two out of 15. And I'm like, how are everyone else like seemingly like doing fine? And that's because they weren't brute forcing college. I was I brought along this habit, like I trucked this habit from high school and I started Bruce Forcing College. Like I'll just like like try to get to the answers, do as much as I can, spend as much time as I, as I can. But in college, unfortunately, those are not resources that you have often. And I sacrifice my happiness and I sacrifice like like my friendships and I sacrifice a lot so I can achieve that, like, okay, get those good grades. But that doesn't work. And after looking at the problem set too, I'm like, I just talked to my friend, like, man, like can I have some help? And they're like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm struggling problem set too. I'm like, how are you not as stressed as me? Like, how is she not as stressed as me? And they're like, oh, I just asked for help. There's so many resources, like go to OH, go to office hours, um, go like work to collaborate. But here I was thinking like I had to go through it all alone. And I think that a big part of CMU was like, they tell us from the beginning that they say, it's okay. You're gonna see scores that you've never seen before in your life. You will see D's and F's and C's, like scores like you cannot fathom to get in high school, but you'll get them in Carnegie Mellon and everyone will get them in Carnegie Mellon. No one, like barely anyone will graduate with this 4.0 goal dream because it's no longer that, like the end goal of Carnegie Mellon or college in general is not to get those good grades, it's to learn, right? So they normalized, they had to normalize failure and struggle. And they also had to normalize that failure and struggle do not come at the expense of your happiness. Failure and struggle can coexist with your happiness. And like, that was so bizarre to me. I'm like, oh, failure and struggle, no. You have to be unhappy if you're failing and struggling. But I, after that, like that darn, that infamous problem set too, I'm like, okay, you have to start asking for help. Keep on asking for help. And it just made college like so much more bearable and so much easier. I didn't do things for the grades anymore. Like the learning, will bring along good grades, but grades will not bring along the learning. And that's something I had to realize as well. So I guess like the simple, like the realization I came to was just like ask for help. It's it's like so simple when I say it, but it just caused so much, like in retrospect, it caused like so much like unhappiness. It caused so much like sacrifices, but it was, and it was really hard to reach that point. But now I think that I'm open to sh open to sharing my failures with everyone. I'm open to sharing my failures to my parents. And like in high school, I wasn't as open to sharing my failures because like I thought that every single time they saw my success, they'd be happy. And I didn't want to show them my failures. But I think that like normalizing asking for help, normalizing like failure and struggle, learning how to struggle is also very important. And like I think that when it comes to my parents, like they emphasize happiness, but like I thought I had this like mind, like, oh. I should be, in order for them to be happy, in order to, for me to be happy, I should also be successful. But I think that at the end, like, they're very open to hearing, like, my struggles. They're very open to hearing, like, if I was unhappy or not. Because at first I was like, oh, I have to be happy in front of them, but you don't have to be. So it took me a while to love seeing me because of that. But I think, like, after you get past this, like, this kind of speed bump after college, thinking, like, get the good grades, be successful, you know? I think that it, like, at the end, like I ended up loving it. I still love it. It's like my, I'm a sophomore in CMU right now and I'm loving it. So it, although it's hard, I don't think that it is unbearable anymore. So I guess that's my experience on my like transition from high school to college. And yeah.
All right, Neha, would you like to share your story? Yeah, so um, I went to a very competitive high school. Um, it was always, how many APs are you taking? Um, how many dual credit classes are you taking? What colleges are you planning on applying to? What are your future plans? It was always about looking for the future. Um, and it was also like, it was also very, um, it was very competitive in that sense. So for me, I did set a cap for myself. I said, I'm not gonna be taking more than three APs a year because I knew mentally I probably wouldn't be able to stand it. But even though I did set myself at this cap say, um, for the sake of my mental health, I had a lot of mental health issues. Um, I started high school pretty shy. Um, and throughout high school, I kind of grew out of that. But mostly it was just the competitiveness that really, like, really made it hard for me. Um, now being in college, uh, it's not as competitive. I chose a particularly less prestigious school. Um, I'm, as you know, I'm going to ASU. So it's considered a party school and it's not taken as seriously, but despite that, it's still the number one college in public research and it's cheaper. Plus it's not as competitive. Like when I attend my classes, I don't have to worry about, oh, that person is gonna like ask for what grade I got because they worried um, they're gonna try and compare themselves to me. Or that person is only trying, is asking for my help because they wanna become better than me, which I definitely had to worry about in high school. Um, I mean, part of the thing for me is I am, currently a freshman at ASU, so I don't have a whole lot of experience in terms of my mental health here in college, but I do have to say it's a lot different than what I expected. Um, at my school, there was this like ideal, I guess, that college professors would be so much stricter than my high school teachers, and that was what all of my AP classes were surrounded by. They were like, we have these set due dates. If you're late, you're late. We won't accept it. Um, there's no retakes, nothing like that. But the reality is, like Elisa was saying, if you're willing to ask for help, most of your professors are willing to accommodate you. There was a point a couple weeks ago where I forgot to take a quiz for one of my psych classes because I had mixed up the due dates. So I just emailed my psych professor, even though inside I was freaking out, like, oh my God, I missed the quiz. It's like 25 points. My grade's gonna go down and I'm gonna fail and I'm not gonna get into med school. Um, I emailed him and he was like, yeah, I understand. And he extended the due date for everyone. So yeah, college is hard. College can be rigorous, but at the same time, asking for help is incredibly important because oftentimes what we think of college and what we expect out of our college professors is actually completely different than um, what we end up getting. They're a lot more supportive than you think and I mean, I'm still taking my first year classes. So obviously a lot of my professors don't have a whole lot of time um, in order to talk about problems, but they are willing to listen. They are willing to um, make sure that you get the help that you need in order to be successful. Thank you so much, Neha. Um, Mason, would you like to go? Yeah, so um, I think uh, how I would describe my high school experience and transitioning to college was, um, I guess, I think it was a little bit more different on uh, relative to most people. Um, I had a struggle to uh, have my parents understand like uh, that I wanted to pursue something that I could be happy with. And I uh, currently major in art. So um, in, I wanted to, it was really difficult for one of my parents um, to really get understand that like, it's harder to like, pursue something that you wouldn't want, you would be miserable with, or you wouldn't be happy with. And then you end up going to college and you're like, why am I doing this? Or you start questioning. Um, 
And I, during high school, I had to kind of try really hard to uh, prove myself and um, my parents that like, I think if I pursue my passion um, with uh, enough effort and I show them that look, like I can do this. Um, I know that uh, I think I can be happy with my career. Um, they'd be fine with it and supportive. And um, in the end, it really, uh, they actually do support me now. Um, I can remember, I think around junior year, I started really trying really hard. Um, and my mom, uh, she was, uh, she, she had a change of heart and thought that uh, it's, it's a career that you can actually pursue and, you know, you have a lot of opportunities and et cetera. And so I think, um, I, I would just give the advice that I think if you let your children have the opportunity to find their way, uh, their interests and what they're, uh, what they like to do, they have an internal drive, of, you know, wanting to pursue that career or pursue that study and actually learn. I think if they are on a set path, they have a heart that they have something that they want to chase or some kind of learning drive, but not in the right direction. Um, so I had that problem, I think during freshman, sophomore year where like inwardly, I really like to draw, I really like to illustrate. Um, but I think the pressure from parents, I know like my mom, she um, told me she tried pursuing art and it didn't work out for her. And um, I think like past experiences may affect um, how, you know, giving advice to your children is like, oh, it may not be a best career because I you know I wasn't great at it or et cetera, whatever reason. Um, I think trying to give your most amount of support uh, and trying to do anything you can is the best way. Cause I think uh, I want, I think best way is for um, your children to not study aimlessly. Um, and yeah, I think it's just um, all about the interest and having that internal drive to keep you going. Thank you so much, Mason. Patrick, would you like to go? Yeah, so hello, I'm Patrick. Um, so a little about myself. My parents um, came to the United States when I was nine. So I moved with them when I was nine. And so they left their life behind back in Korea. And so even from a young age, I knew that my parents had given up a significant portion of their life just to come here. And even though that, even though they told me all the time, like, oh, you should always be happy. You should, like happiness is, is the number one thing you should pursue. I always had this thought in the back of my mind that basically kind of made me feel indebted or owed to my parents, um, which is why I couldn't shake off this feeling that I had to do my very best to not disappoint them. So that kind of mindset carried on throughout high school and middle school, I guess. Um, so I was basically very good at following my parents' instructions because I didn't want to deviate away from their plan. And I always thought that they were these perfect people that knew everything and basically had a set plan for me that would work. So I remember in high school, um, I had these checklists and basically I would have to achieve each thing off those checklists. So for example, getting going to state um, in a sport, going to state and with music, getting a leadership position, having good GPA, all that stuff. That was just like the things that you just needed to do and your college application would be fine. Um, I don't think I really stopped though in any of those high school years to really ask myself, was I doing things that made me happy? I didn't really have the time or the energy to stop myself and ask that question, mostly because I was in the group of things and I was just assuming that this is just how you live your life, you know? But then towards the end of my junior year, I had this big talk with my parents and basically 
he told me after you head off to college we're gonna basically like not care about what you do so you can do whatever you want and basically that was like a really big curveball for me because I was always used to following instructions, having somebody tell me what I should be doing, not really thinking for myself. So college admissions uh, comes around and then that time was stressful, obviously. Um, but after the college admissions came out, I had about three to four months of just basically um, me time, independent time to really think for myself, what do, who do I wanna become in life? And how do I wanna live my life so that I can be really happy and how I can be successful. Um, and definitely my mental state in high school before college admissions and throughout college admissions was very, very bad. <laughs> um, I was constantly um, worried and anxious that I wouldn't be able to meet the standards set by my parents or by myself actually. And more importantly, I was kind of unsure of what I was supposed to be in life. But during those four months, I really got a chance to just um, talk to my parents a lot, talk to um, the people around me a lot, and really take the time to think for myself um, who I wanted to be. So in college, now I'm on, at Georgia Tech campus, and I'm very nervous, obviously, because um, I know that it's a very new environment. I'm from Washington, Georgia is basically all the way across the country, so I'm nervous. But I had this goal that I just wanted to make sure I have a good like discipline for grades, but I don't stress myself too much over them because I knew that grades weren't everything. Instead, I tried my best to keep a healthy balance between academics, um, health, like physical health and mental health um, by making sure I worked out, making sure I um, joined the clubs and met friends and reached out to people so that I could basically focus on my mental and physical health. And through that transition, I think it was really important that I made um, really close friends by basically reaching out because it turns out other people are just as nervous as you when you first walk into that campus. And reaching out to them is not gonna hurt you in any way because everyone's nervous. In fact, one of my um, best friends on campus right now is my roommate. And I'm really lucky that I have had the chance to like room with him last year. He's also my roommate right now. <laughs> um, but it's really nice just to have somebody or a group of people that you can just talk to when you get to campus, just really about anything, not just about grades or classes. And I think that really helped my mental health in college. And that is very, it's a po it's positive change from my mental health back in high school. Great. Thank you all so much for giving your insight about your mental health during your transition to college. Um, we will now be having an open Q&A with the college panelists and also Dr. Lau. So Dr. Lau, if you could also turn on your camera. Um, if you have any questions for our panel, please use the Q&A Zoom, fu Zoom function to ask your questions. So we have a few here. Okay. So one question um, from Jed Tai is, I'm the Asian, I'm a, I'm the Asian American child of immigrants and I'm now a parent myself. One of the things that I struggle with was when I heard the encouragement of being perfect, or when I passively, passive aggressively compared myself to others, I internalized that shame. As a parent now, I've really tried to stay away from that type of shame-based motivation. However, as hard as I try, some of this still comes through from time to time since that's what I experience. What are some of the best ways to pick up on child, on children possibly feeling shame? 
Uh, thank you. That is a very good question. Actually, recently we had another event just to talk about uh, issues along this line. Because uh, now as more and more parents realizing the issue and how serious they're kind of forcing their uh, beliefs onto their children, what kind of damage it could do or uh, to their children or what kind of price their children could be paying, they want it to be less anxious. So they wanted to try to think differently, but it's not easy to do as I kind of briefly mentioned earlier. So I would really uh, highly recommend you look into uh, doc, uh, Dr. Uh, Safali, um, her work uh, on conscious parenting. Uh, it's a combination of Eastern philosophy plus Western psychology. Uh, it's basically meditation plus self-reflection. So as parents, we can get a chance to really learn how to focus inwardly on ourselves, watching our language, watching our thoughts, watching our uh, uh, triggers, you know, so we can kind of uh, working, uh, so, so when we are fa facing with issues, our children kind of present to us, we don't just reactively doing the way that we are used to, you know, uh, started to yelling, screaming, you know, being, because it's actually, uh, it's something actually quite natural for our children to do. Sometimes the way we reacted actually out of our own fear from our upbringing. So to be able to slow down that process, meditate, meditation, meditation, not medication, not, not taking pills, right? So meditating, uh, to follow the thought we talked about, uh, those apps, uh, and sometimes there are some, some very uh, established practices you can practice together. It's the purpose is to allow us to focus inwardly. So it's like building your muscle. You know, sometimes we have children, uh, we have youth coming to my office, um, and what we are all uh, talking about, about uh, among our practitioners is to take every opportunity to emphasize the importance of meditation. Meditation, okay, meditation is no longer something just people, oh, people from India do probably, <laughs> but actually now is a very well researched uh, with experimental data that it has very good positive impacts on our mental well-being. So parents meditate, so you learn to be mindful, and uh, be able to breathe, be able to reflect. And when you are um, talking about uh, combating or set free, set yourself free from those old beliefs, it's very, very uh, important. It takes a lot of effort. So it's not overnight. It, uh, uh, so uh, it's a very good question. And so there's a lot to be said about that. Um, and basically learn how to relax. Thank you so much, Dr. Lau. Um, next question is for our, high for our college student panel. Um, the question is, I'm a high schooler and I have an idea about what I want to be my career, but I know, I know it's going to disappoint my parents because it's not becoming a doctor slash becoming an engineer or um, one of those typical um, careers that Asian parents agree with. Any advice on talking to my parents about this? Um, is it fine if I talk? Yeah, so um, I think I've mentioned that um, when I was going through that period where I kind of had a, a fighting moment where with my parents, um, specifically my mom, specifically my mom, um, I just had I think, I think in my situation, it was more like I had to kind of prove myself, like think how invested and how well I'm, how well I can do, or I guess, like just kind of proving yourself and your, to whoever um, that you're really taking this seriously. And it's not just like, a, oh, I'm gonna just kind of, loosely do it and then you know I think it's um probably just proving yourself I I 
that's how I did it. <laughs> um, but yeah. Oh, yeah, kind of going off of what Mason said, um, I think kind of a similar thing happened for me in my junior year of high school. And basically, I had I really wanted to sw stop swimming. And my parents were like, okay, what are you going to do if you don't swim? And until I could answer that question confidently and show them like plan my specific plans for what I was going to do, they weren't going to let me stop swimming. So I think to answer that question directly, you need to show them some at least like a concrete proof or plan of what you're going to do and actually show some steps that you're taking to achieve that because in the end I think all of um, the parents would like you to be happy and more more happy than successful so yeah um, the next question is To Dr. Lau, do you have any specific suggestions that parents can try to help our children who want to achieve things like straight A's but are quite stressed out and anxious? That's another very good question. You know, first of all, uh, for parents to be able to ask that a question, as opposed to kind of quote unquote proud of my children, she or he, himself are so self-driven, you know, she wanted to get good grades, you know, from that. And now more and more parents kind of realize how potentially this could be hurtful for our children. This is something to be congratulated. Uh, so, but at the same time, uh, I think a lot of the children, uh, they get there not really by themselves. It is what I have talked about. It is our internal uh, an anxiousness, uh, our own anxiety that having been projected onto them all these years, you know, ch children don't just born and want it to be the best, you know, it's because all these years we've been praising them, you know, whenever they bring home a trophy, we're so excited, you know, whenever they bring back a B, you know, we will be mercy, we don't, we don't say anything, you know, so, uh, so I think it's depending on the age of the children, uh, for, uh, the, the, there's a, there's a book by, uh, it's called the Smart Parenting for Smart Kids, and uh, so uh, that's one resource parents can uh, look into, but have a conversation, really talk to children, because as I said, if the, the seeds were planted by you, uh, if you could talk about the unconditional love uh, that our children, unfortunately, most of them already internalize that. They kind of know only when you get good grades, you'll be happy. And some of us probably secretly say, yeah, that's what I wanted. You know, I really want them to realize they better bring home good grades, you know. So these are very, very harmful for our uh, kids um, being able to have their own space to identify who they are, to, to so these are kids tend to have identity issues later, you know, just as uh, um, some of our, our panelists talked about. So be able to have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation, especially share your own childhood story with them, not to brag about it, remember, is to uh, share why sometimes you have these anxieties and why that you actually realize how harmful they could be. So really make them believe or be authentic, uh, be genuine and authentic that they actually understand you really meant it. You know, uh, for instance, I have a quick story. I have a friend who had to uh, rush to her college children, uh, college son, uh, because the son had some um, uh, mental health issues and because he failed to two classes. And uh, ultimately he had to delay graduate college for one year, but mom kept telling her, uh, get, telling him, don't worry, you know, uh, you could still be great, you know, even though you, you fail two classes. But we, it's very hard to, for children to really take your words for it until this young, young man, essentially, uh, after struggling through 
finally find a job and came back to tell mom, say, mom, you're right. They actually don't even ask for my grades. <laughs> you know? So it is true. Why our children have these internal stress? Uh, it, it is the root is in us. So having the conversation, not just to be uh, so willing to say, how am I going to help you? You tell them how you have learned from the process, how you have been different mom now or different dad now, that you actually recognize the, the importance of their health. So, and it takes time for them to really be able to outgrow that. And also they might need professional help. Thank you, Dr. Lau. Um, the next question is for the high school panel. Looking back on your high school years, what do you wish your parents would have done to make your life easier? Would anyone want to answer that question? Honestly, I think if I had had their support a little bit more, I know that in terms of like my mental health and all of that, they definitely did support me. But there were some things that I wanted to try out in high school um, that they weren't necessarily on the same page with. Like I was super into um, competing in this business competition that I had um, that I had joined, and they didn't necessarily want me to do that because they thought it was taking my attention away from like all the sciences and like going into meds, uh, like getting ready for med and all of that. So just being more supportive and trusting that I can make my own decisions, I guess, um, would have been really helpful for me. I kind of want to add on to that. Like, I think something that, like kind of putting a twist to the question, like, well, I think that my parents like helped alleviate my stress is that they gave me space. They like took a step back and they, they trusted me to like, like they never checked my grades. They never like checked up on like, ooh, like how's that homework assignments doing? Or like, how's your SAT studying going? Since they gave me space and took a step back and they trusted that I could, like I could motivate myself to get those grades. And um, it was even so during college application season. Like they, like I really appreciate that how, like I didn't have someone breathing down like the back, my back, like wondering when are you gonna get that college essay done or when are you gonna finish that application? Like, I think they like allowing your child to just like trusting your child that they're going to get the stuff done, that they're gonna do them like the stuff for themselves, like doing, getting those grades, getting those um, like college application stuff out of the way, like for yourself. I think that like kind of alleviate a lot of the stress, but like initial thing is just like having like, I think, like touching on what Nehas just said, like, I think allowing your child to just kind of roam free, like release them into the wild and have them like kind of just discover what they like to do by themselves. And I think that I, like a part of my, like a part of my, a uh, part of my high school was my parents just letting me roam free in a way, sort of. They allowed me to like pick up like, oh, what happens if I do Taekwondo? What happens if I do dance? What if happens if I played flag football of all sports? I think that like, um, I think that letting, allowing more space to even let me roam even more free than what I was like originally doing. I think that um, that was very particularly helpful as well. I also want to add on. Um, so I would say, I think how I would treat high school is like, a, a way for, um, like, you know, Lisa said, a way for uh, the student to discover, like, what are they interested in? Because I think when I treated high school, I think, like, um, I want to look around and see, like, what do I want to pursue? Like, what do I want to, uh, like, have an interest in? And through that, I can do well and then go to a college and get a degree in that. Um, and I think a lot of my friends, um, even as freshmen and sophomores in college, they had the problem where I did so well in school, in high school, and I'm still kind of aimlessly, aimlessly trying to discover what I'm doing. And that kind of, uh, in, in a way, interferes their, you know, what they're trying to learn and chase after. Um, so like, again, I think trying to be more open-minded um, and letting your child have more freedom and what, what they want to learn. I think um, 
I when I, I was once I once read this quote by Alan Watts, and it was, "It's better to have a short life that is full of what you're doing, like you what, what you like to do, than a long life spent in a miserable way." And so when I read that quote, that really hit me for. I really wanted to intensively chase what was I was interested in, and I wouldn't be aimlessly like walking in the desert trying to understand like like what am I doing here? Like, what am why am I studying this? There's just no point, you know. Um, so again, just be more open-minded, um, and you know, there's always multiple paths, you know. Yeah. Um, I have one question, one last question for both the college students and um, Dr. Lau. So the question is from Jenny Chen. She asks, one panelist indicated that it is important to enjoy learning rather than having good grades. I agree with that too. But in reality, grades are so important to stay competitive when looking for an internship or job after graduation. How should a college student balance both? Would uh, any of the students wanted to answer first, or is this for, for, for me or for both, for us all? For anyone who wants to. Okay. Any of you wanted to oh, take I a could, stab at I could it? start, sure. <laughs> um, so for me, that was actually one of the big um, stress factors coming into college of uh, GPA, because I knew that companies look at your GPA. It's one of the first things that companies look at when they're um, considering it for either internship or a job position. So coming in, I was like, okay, 4.0 is my goal. You know, all A's and that's what I'm gonna get. And throughout college so far, so I'm a sophomore right now, um, I realized that they care about grades to a certain extent. They only care about if your if your GPA is above a certain level. After that point, getting an A or A minus or B doesn't really set you apart from anyone else. Instead, what sets you apart is your projects, your experiences, and how you work with other people. That's that all comes through during interviews, and um, it really sh distinguishes an applicant from somebody who just focuses on studying and has a 4.0. So after I realized that. It's not that I slacked off on academics, but rather I was able to take a lot of pressures off of my academics and focus, in, focus on doing things um, like projects. So for me, it was joining a robotics club to start a, a project. It was joining a research lab to do um, like some research work. It was joining some clubs that focused on medical devices, stuff like that. I think that's a lot a better use of your time than if you were to use all 100% of your time into grinding to get a 95 or 100 on a test rather than a low B. Yeah, I, thank you. I, I just wanted to add to that. And a lot of time, uh, especially parents, you know, um, Especially when the parents, uh, especially when our children living in home, when we they are so close to us, we feel as if if we kind of let them do something, they are just going to go all the way down. Actually, actually just as Patrick uh, uh, shared, uh, this is not only in college, but also true in, in high school. Our children need that room, need that space to really find themselves, to be themselves. And in many cases, they actually Excel maybe at the very beginning, you know, they kind of drop a little bit, but then they kind of go, whoop, oh, that, that's not what I wanted. And they are going to pick themselves up. It's a little messy sometimes, especially if you started this process earlier when the kids are younger, that's actually even better, you know, it's just from a very practical point, you know, it will not impact their high school grades, you know. And now, unfortunately, we don't allow children to make any mistakes. You know, even their homework is 
counted towards their grades. God forbid, they are supposed to learn through doing homework. They're not supposed to make any mistakes in homework. That's just ridiculous. But our parents actually bought into it. You know, they actually worked hand in hand with the school and really banging at their children. You know, they cannot misstep since very early age. This is so harmful. So I think the parents, you, we need to uh, stay away from this and step out, do some chilling meditation ourselves, and then being able to really think this through. Uh, if the uh, children can find their, 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 their true passion, first of all, they are going to be not only having less of uh, like identity issues and less struggle, but also they might have a uh, stronger, um, greater motivation. Another thing is, another way to look at it. Okay, you let your kid kind of fall a little bit, like let them make their own decision. Actually, I have one parent told me, uh, once her, uh, once their son got into high school, he had a, family meeting and proudly tell the parents from now on, I'm responsible for everything myself and please step back. So actually you should encourage your child to do that to you so that you could be allowed to step back and let them fail a little bit. And yeah, they may not get into Harvard. They may not get into even say Carnegie Mellon. So what, you know, they may really thrive if they really found themselves. They could be a big fish in a small pound. And actually, if you look at the, the book by uh, 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 the name, <laughs> uh, kind of, uh, the book's name is called David and Goliath. Uh, Goliath. Um, if somebody could find his name, it's talking about, it may not be a great idea to get to the best college you barely get into okay it may be better to get into the second or third institute you could get into because that is exact precisely as patrick just uh, mentioned that give you more time to really develop all these other broader range of skill and without really spending all your time on the on the grades and that could be one of the strategies actually to to uh, achieve the balance of a good academic and, and good career as also a good mental health. Um, I kind of want to build off of that. So I mentioned earlier that I chose to go to ASU. I did choose to apply to some pretty prestigious schools. Um, I got into USC as well. But I eventually chose ASU over USC because of the competitiveness because of what um, Dr. Lulia was saying. It's better to be a big fish in a small pond and really thrive in an area that's not as, or thrive in a school that's not as prestigious as just trying, then like just trying to keep up with everyone um, in a school where everyone is prestigious. Because the more prestigious the school is, the more competitive it is because everyone was the top of their class. Everyone had the highest GPAs. Whereas if you go to a less prestigious school, um, the education there isn't necessarily bad. Like ASU is amazing. I enjoy it a lot and it's pretty challenging for me, but I don't have to worry about that competitiveness. I don't have to, because I know there are some people who didn't do as well as I did in high school. There are some people who did even better than I did in high school. And I can become, like I can interact with them and I can, um, learn from their experiences and they can learn from mine and vice versa. And going back to the question, uh, usually if you do love learning, you have that motivation to succeed. So typically if you love learning, you have that motivation to become, to get, um, to do the work that's required for the higher GPA. All right, so sorry to cut off the panel, but we are nearing the end of our webinar today. However, if you have any remaining questions for our speaker or panelists, please feel free to remain after the webinar for an additional 10 to 15 minute long Q&A. All of our panelists have generously agreed to stay a bit longer to answer any remaining questions. 
Thank you so much again to our speakers, Dr. Bonnie Lau, as well as our amazing panelists, Patrick, Mason, Niha, and Elisa for your insights, experiences, and we hope that this has given the audience members some strategies that they can implement um, either for yourself or for your family, and that you will be able to take this information to better support you and your family's mental health. Thank you again to Let's Talk for this amazing opportunity to facil facilitate necessary conversations about mental health. If you like this webinar, we invite you to check out Project Lotus for more events like these. Please feel free to visit our website and social media to keep updated on blogs, resources, and other projects. We know that we were not able to answer all the questions today, but we will be hosting more Project Lotus webinars on different topics regarding mental health in the Asian American community, so please keep an eye out for those. Additionally, the Let's Talk conference is still ongoing. There will, be a there will be a webinar reimagining college admissions for exploration, reflect, reflect, sorry, reflectation, ref reflecting <laughs> and healing for high school students. And it will be hosted two weeks from today on Sunday, November 22nd, and registration will be opening soon. So please keep an eye out for that. We hope that students can join us for that webinar. For those, who, um, for those people who do not have remaining questions, please have a good night. We look forward to seeing you at future Let's Talk and Project Lotus events. Thank you so much for attending. If you have any other remaining questions, please feel free to stay in the webinar and ask your question. Oh, Melissa, you want to continue read some of the questions already posted or? Yeah, I'm going to be reading some of the questions that have already been posted. And also if any other people can just ask some more questions, I'll be saying those ones as well. All right, so we have a question here. Um, Dr. Lau, thank you for being here. Do you think that it's easier to be an Asian American youth today versus the 19th? the 90s slash 2000s. It seems that though mental health awareness is growing, so is depression and anxiety amongst, among this generation of youth. What do you think? Uh, yes, that's a, uh, the, the, that's a very good question. I, I, I have to say from my own experience, I feel like uh, the anxieties among our youth has, increased. Uh, there are many factors. Uh, one of the main factors is the uh, explosion of the internet. And so the social media and the, and the amount of information or knowledge online, all of these things really all become um, part of the environment that we are living in, especially our children growing in. And uh, with that, with relatively limited in-person connections and also uh, less time for free play, all these are contributing to more stress and less, less opportunities to develop some of these uh, coping skills as our children growing up. Uh, in other words, we used to uh, say have, uh, oh, I should say most of the uh, professionals will say the best way for our children, uh, the, um, the mental health is for them to have more free play time, you know, since the, since they're very young. And, and nowadays, sometimes we say, oh, they, they, they play, they, 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 my children play soccer. No, soccer is not free play. Soccer is uh, adults making rules and uh, just uh, having them running around. We're talking about the old style free play when children really gather, say 10, five, eight kids getting together in the neighborhood, they have to iron out all kinds of disagreements. They have to set their rules and they have to deal with a lot of um, uh, challenges, 
conflicts. So those things are no longer part of our children's lives. So if uh, we could add some of this back into our children's life, it could be helpful. But the answer is yes, in general, our children are having more screen time, less interaction with the real human being in person. So that uh, in itself uh, contributed to some of the, uh, uh, I should say, contribute a lot of the issues. And not, not to mention the, uh, just the uh, globalization. And so actually produced a lot of the, the anxieties. Uh, so uh, the, uh, our, our children is very uh, uh, forced basic to, to deal with. Would anyone else want to answer that question? Okay, if not, we can move on. Um, we have another question here for Dr. Lau. Mental health was defined as something that was impended normal function and contribute, contribute, oh my God, sorry, I can't talk right now. <laughs> Contribution <laughs> to society. What defines these broad standards? Yeah, uh, my take on that, I, I'm sure everyone could have their own readings through these words. Uh, my uh, interpretation will be basic uh, functioning. Uh, say, if I'm not even talking about constantly being happy, you know, actually that's another thing that when, when you look into the conscious parenting, that's another important concept. What is happiness? You know, it's, it's, it's actually very stressful to tell our children, oh, I want you is to be happy. Happy all the time? You mean you never feel sad? I mean, we parents, we cannot even say our life is full of happiness. Why we ask our children to be happy? That in itself creates a lot of stress for our children, a lot of pressure. So be able to deal with, struggle through the downtime. And so uh, this is the skill that we should allow our children to take the time to develop. So that means there will be time they need to be with their sadness for a while. And so you'll be there and with them and you both recognize feeling sad or feeling really, really not happy at this moment is normal part of a human experience. So it's not something like, let's get rid of the sadness quickly, as quick as possible. Uh, so, so it's not, all these, is, you we're not talking about any kind of mental uh, unhealthiness. You know, we're talking about mental unhealthiness um, or not being able to contribute to the society, especially this one, contributing to the society. Almost like, I think everyone you could, we, we tend to have very high bars for our children. You, you have to really contribute to the community or, or contribute to the to the society, to, the, to this world or leave a mark and all that kind of thing. And this is in itself also quite high, high, high bar. Uh, I personally, I mean, I'm, I'm only speaking for, my, 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 for, for myself. You are not taking resources from the society. Uh, you, you, you are, I mean, that's already a, a plus. You know, you uh, are responsible for your own living. I mean, if you are not a big spender, then you can find a easy uh, job or what have you to be able to meet your, meet your needs and, and have a happy family or what have you. That in itself, it's already contributing to the, uh, to the world. Uh, so, uh, this is really depends on uh, everyone's value system. And I would say, I could give you an example, my children. Um, I have two, two children, my, my, my son definitely is, I don't know, he's still just like very focused, a typical kind of, uh, 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 in a way like Asian boy, I don't have to worry about it. He, he went on to, uh, to, uh, call, uh, to graduate school to try to get a, a PhD in engineering, uh, but at the same time, my daughter is a determinately uh, uh, graduate from college and wanted to be a, a baker in the in the local bakery. So that I 
it's uh, I I could say I, I'm pretty chill about that. Uh, so he her life is, is hers. And she, if she wanted to change her plan, that's her things. If doesn't want to change her plan, want to be a stay at home mom, what have you. All these are contributing to the society. I think as opposed to cannot stand the stress and um, and and so, so it's a different uh, kind of life. So uh, I would say uh, no definitive definition. So you make your decision and more importantly, your children should make their choices. Hi, our next question is, I struggle between choosing a career path that will follow my passion and choosing a career path that will make me money. I'm not concerned as much about parent approval rather than my future security. So I, um, so they didn't know if this was the right place to ask this question, but I think that this is a yes. good question to ask. Yeah. So any of the students or Dr. Lau want to um, talk a little bit about this question? I would love to see, uh, yeah. Um, so I had the opportunity to attend this special program at my, through my school district called Health Careers. And basically it's a two year program for, um, for students who are interested in medicine to determine what exactly they want to do and to start getting um, start getting experience like completing some rotations at the hospital or attending volunteer services, that kind of stuff. And one thing that they really mentioned in terms of creating future goals is research. Research, what are all the possible um, outcomes? What are all the possible jobs? Research the um, average pay interview people if you can if you can because you'll because from them you'll understand what a day-to-day -day life is like as opposed to just doing research on the internet so i think in that case um making sure that you do thorough research about your um about all of the fields that you're that you're considering and deciding to you what means the most um, that what you value most is really important. I'd also like to add on, um, in college, uh, your professors are your friends. Um, you guess if you get to know them, you know, they can, they can go on and on and on about their profession and what they can go into uh, and, you know, types of careers. Um, I know colleges have tons of college fairs um, about like, something that's related to your field. Um, but most importantly, I would say, go to your professor and whichever, under whichever, um, you know, uh, career you're, you want to uh, be interested in or chase after, um, they're always there to help you. They're always there to give you advice and let you know like, hey, so um, if you like this and this, you know, maybe you're interested in this field. Um, you know, they've been through college and, you know, they have firsthand and they know how to, um, they're going to be there with you to teach you about whatever program or whatever career. Would anyone else want to answer this question? Okay, if not, we can move on to the next question. Um, so the next question is, I understand that the phrase, I want to be happy, is a kind of stress. Then what should parents say to their kids? Um, and they gave a few examples, like be yourself, love yourself, accept yourself. Again, I would love to hear the young people's opinion first. Yeah, so I think like my parents have said something along the vein of like be happy, but I think like Throughout my high school was definitely not perfect in terms of personal life. I wasn't happy all the time, but I think like being told like it's okay to be unhappy was also like perfectly fine. Like, and having, and because like I was told like it's okay to be unhappy. I think that like giving the space to like share with your like parents, even though it's not like the coolest thing is like, oh, I'm gonna talk to my parents about how I'm like really sad. Like, I, like it takes like a really big step to like admit that, oh, like I'm not happy at this point. And I think that like saying that, like be happy, I think you can kind of do like the, like the contra 
positive almost and say like it's it's okay to be not happy and like I think be yourself is also perfectly great because I think that a lot of times we are like conformed into this mold of like do this you have like I like what Patrick brought up like this checklist you're conformed into this mold but a lot of the times when we like try to like push ourselves into this mold like we kind of we do lose ourselves I think that like being yourself is also like a perfect way to like perfect thing to tell a, a student and I think I if I were told that from in high school I think that it, it could have brought me like great intuition on how to approach other things in life so yeah so would you like to be um encouraged to be yourself or you think that could make it more stressful Elisa 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 yeah, I think that Elisa. like Elisa, yeah. <laughs> it's a it's a weird I think that like being told like with the pressure of like trying to be successful, like being yourself makes you want to choose something that deviates successfulness. But I think that like um like so yeah, in some cases like being told like be yourself, like it's kind of hard to choose what to like be when you want to be yourself. So I like I definitely think that like if like that stress that we carry over our head of like trying to deviate to a success I think that like again like be yourself but in the process of learning how to be yourself it's also okay to fail like it's okay if like um you did something wrong when you're like trying to approach this new like version of yourself I think is also like perfectly fine as well so I hope that touched on what you like what your question was so yeah I I, I think the um it has to do with how we define success, isn't it? You know, sometimes even when parents talking about, I just want you to be happy, what they're really saying is you have to be successful, okay? If you're not successful, you're not going to be happy. So so parents actually, so we need to watch out, you know, the, the, the uh, so the, for, for the children, I think what they really need, the space, they need space to really, to, to experiment, to try. So whether that, equipped to successful or not, or happy or not, that's not as important or not as direct. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's almost like learning to focus on the present, you know, what, uh, as opposed to think too much into the future. I kind of subscribe into <laughs> Uh, this kind of thought now, it's um, having two of my children all graduate from college, one in graduate school, one in already working. It's um, sometimes we think too much, we have parents, we think too much into the into the future. Uh, say, uh, worry about the, the, the college, worry about their life, worry about, you know, how they not be, you know, living under the bridge, you know. <laughs> so we, we worry so much. Actually, uh, one of you already talked about if, if we, we have kind of this kind of healthy families, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we didn't really experience so much trauma. We grew up normally, you know. Uh, I think we have, children have a uh, natural ability to to learn and wanted to 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 learn more uh, they but it's it's that excessive anxiety worry about our children not being successful not happy actually when we kept telling them i want you to be happy i want you to be successful i want you to be happy we are sending the message that, that we are so worried about you will not be successful you will not be happy so I guess sometimes instead of talking about too much about the future, you're really talking about the interest, right? Instead of just saying, I want to do to be successful. Yeah. What kind of, you know, what are you into now? You know, what, what uh, what's your interest now? You know, what are you really uh, uh, spending a lot of time? You know, is that fun? You know, what, what is it? What do you learn? Or, or just talking about stuff, I think, it's just let the kids figure out who they wanted to be. And I do understand as an Asian parent, uh, you know, and uh, first generation I myself, it's not easy. It's almost like, oh my gosh, I'm losing control. Yes, it does mean you're going to lose a, a, probably a big deal of control about what a child may choose to do or become. But that could give them a chance to really live in their reality, not the reality we constructed for them. So uh, even now, 
I, um, I often hear parents saying, but you see, uh, I have a different opinion from my husband. You know, I'm the one really wanted, you know, um, get things done, you know, try your best, you know. And he's kind of laid back, you know, we have different opinions. And I sometimes catch them and just say, but always trying to everything do your best. Is that a good thing? And sometimes some good, some parents after meditating, after reflect, uh, reflection, after um, learning about parenting, parenting themselves, they can catch themselves. They realize maybe this mentality of everything, I have to be the best, I have to do my best, may or may not be the healthiest approach in life. You know, sometimes uh, I also use another example that when um, my daughter went with her boyfriend family and uh, vacation, then came back saying, oh, their family do, that's a vacation. 11 o'clock, everyone wake up, say, what to do today? You know, let's see where we're going. And all the rest of our families, <laughs> what we do, when we go on vacation the day before, we say, tomorrow, seven o'clock, get up. And then we go to one, two, three, four, these places. So we would not be wasting our time in our vacation. So we have a totally different kind of philosophy about what is life, what is a good life, you know, even for vacation, you are so stressed out, you know, imagine the rest of our life. So we, as parents, we need to sometimes maybe just focus on the present. Um, and this is uh, that meditation, uh, cultural uh, Eastern philosophy tend to really teach us. Unfortunately, a lot of us, we went through cultural revolution and that's another stressor in our life. Uh, so we went through cultural revolution or we are the wounded child of cultural revolution ourselves. We didn't really learn too much about these Eastern philosophies. So we could not really easily let go of a lot of things. So we are always worry. So um, maybe just uh, not try to talk to our children and say, be this, be that, and just uh, talk about some other things about their lives. Right. I hope that's helpful. I'm so sorry, but the time has run out for our webinar and it looks like there's no more questions. So we hope that we were able to answer all of your questions. Thank you so much to Let's Talk, our panelists and Dr. Lau for being here today. Um, and thank you everyone for attending. Again, please keep an eye out for future Project Lotus webinars as well as Let's Talk, um, Let's Talk conference webinars. All right, I hope you all have a great night. Thank you so much again for coming. Thank you. Great. Could you guys stay a few minutes for debriefing? Yeah. Oh yeah, Lisa, Patrick, how you guys been? Wait, should we stop the recording first? Oh. <laughs>